Okay, great. There are already a few people, so welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we will learn more about perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. Uh, we will have two speakers. Uh, yeah, there is a uh, uh, Dr. Erkan Aydin from uh, LMU and Dr. Urs uh, Eberhard from Fluxin. The first talk uh, focuses more on fabrication, characterization of tandem PVs, whereas the second is on the simulation optimization. Erkan uh, is, a, is a pleasure to have him here. He's a, a well-known researcher working on perovskite solar cell from KAUST. Recently, he started uh, as a group leader at LMU in Munich. He has a PhD from top university in Turkey, and uh, as I said, he worked at KAUST, where he achieved uh, record efficiencies in perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. He now directs the Imper Space project. This is an ERC starting grant and the is going to develop a space grade perovskite based tandem solar cells. And today, Aydin will present the uh, ultra efficiency perovskite uh, silicon tandem solar cells. And uh, welcome, Erkan. Uh, the floor is yours. Just uh, as a comment, uh, please ask all your questions in the chat, and we will have a QA session at the end. All right. Yeah, again, uh, thanks again for uh, inviting me um, to uh, to give a talk here. It's a pleasure to accept it for sure. And uh, well, today, uh, as you mentioned, actually, I will try to talk about um, some the recent progress that we have made at Kaust for the uh, the perovskite silicon tandem cells. Before starting, uh, first of all, um, and I have to tell you that this uh, majority of the work that I have done here, I, I will present here, have been done at KAUST. And uh, for sure, uh, for these works, I collaborated with several colleagues at KAUST. Uh, and actually, between 2016 and uh, 2023, um, uh, 2024, last seven and a half years, I worked with several researchers at KAUST. Uh, and also collaborated with several well-known institutes. And today, actually, as I said, I will talk about uh, the, the research basically uh, made by the team and myself uh, at Kaos KPB Lab. And I recently moved to LMU Munich uh, chemistry department in the physical chemistry. I'm establishing my own research group. Uh, basically, the motivation of my group will be developing realistic and ultra efficient tandem photovoltaics for both Earth and space applications. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, the space applications, recently I acquired the ERC starting grant, and this grant is basically uh, developing a high efficiency, high specific power, um, low Earth um, orbital sp uh, stable uh, perovskite based tandem solar cells. Um, before starting, um, I mean about uh, the details of the cell fabrication, I want to talk about. A bit more motivation for uh, working on efficient solar cells. Uh, well, this is a bit general introduction, but it's better to talk about this because if there are some people who are not coming from this field, it's useful. Uh, very briefly, uh, uh, the solar photovoltaics um, uh, recently, actually, especially for in last five, seven years, um, is uh, occupying the majority of the capacity additions. And if you look at the graph, um, on the right hand side, um, well, okay, uh, here, um, uh, I mean, especially for in 2021 and 2022, you see that uh, the, the, the total installed capacity per year is majorly composed of by the uh, the solar photovoltaics. And I don't have the numbers for 2023, but this, there is actually increasing trend. So it's a good news. Actually, we are using solar photovoltaics more and more. Uh, and recently, um, uh, actually last year, we already exceeded the one terawatt installed capacity. This number was already 500 gigawatt in 2018. And in a few years, this number jumped to one terawatt level. Uh, and actually, from now on, uh, we are talking about terawatt scale um, power generation technology. It's a it's a huge capacity. Um, well, um, uh, actually, this is exponentially increasing uh, in 2023. Uh, our total installed capacity, uh, uh, I mean, increased well beyond the one terawatt with added capacity of 350 gigawatt uh, in 2023. And this number will be reaching maybe the 500 gigawatt and beyond uh, in 2024. Obviously, uh, if in 2018, six years ago, the total capacity was 500 gigawatt, but still uh, recently we are expanding the capacity more and more. Well, it's a good news again, uh, because 
uh, all the countries made an agreement uh, in the Paris with the Paris Agreement. Uh, we want to do transition to clean energy as soon as possible. And uh, there is a goal to do, complete this transition by 2050 for many countries they put a signature on this. Um, and uh, uh, there is a recent policy article uh, came out uh, in science. Um, and in this policy article, um, and the, uh, the, the Nancy Hegel and also the, the large team, um, they explain uh, what should be our goal for the next years. Uh, basically, uh, we are expecting a 25% um, market growth by 2032, so the 33, sorry. Uh, and actually, we have to increase the, the manufacturing capacity um, until 3 terawatt per year. This is not installed capacity, it's a manufacturing capacity. And if we do that, um, and actually in 2050, we can reach the capacity of 70 terawatt. And actually, this is a, a predicted realistic scenario uh, for um, utilizing the, the solar photovoltaics. So you can understand that from the, the level of the uh, one, two terawatts to 70 terawatt, we need a lot of solar cells to be installed and to be manufactured. Um, well, uh, I mean, for sure, if um, if you want that more solar panels are deployed, then we have to make it more competitive. Um, good thing, good thing is that solar photovoltaic panels um, they are really um, already competitive as of 2023 among the all other renewables and also for sure fossil fuels compared to them, uh, photovoltaics are really cost effective. Um, and actually recently uh, there is a record low at the module prices, PV module prices, as you know, uh, for the PERC modules recently, um, and this decreased the 10 cent per watt level. And actually the further um, reductions are really possible. And, uh, and uh, I mean, basically the whole community is working for, for this. Uh, but um, in the long run, uh, the PV cost is driven by uh, the performance of the PV systems because uh, the PV module prices, there are some uh, other costs, we call them balance of system costs, including frames, glasses, installation costs, and the, you know, the land costs. Um, and the, these are the, the, the prices pretty much fixed, it's difficult to change. Uh, the only thing that we can uh, push further is the power conversion efficiency. From the unit area, we need to get more power out from the solar photovoltaics. So this means that we need more and uh, R&D activities in that direction. So this graph is showing um, the, the trend of the, the PV module prices recently. And as you see, um, and the, in the low cost market, even it's below the uh, 0.1 euro per, per watt. Um, well, good, yeah, we can uh, make uh, we, we have to make uh, efficient devices, but for sure we have some limits. Uh, we are not, uh, we don't have unlimited resources for sure. And uh, we have some thermodynamic limits. And in the graph that you can see here, uh, uh, we have some losses. These are, uh, there are some thermodynamic losses, Carnot loss, and the, there is a Boltzmann loss. And these are the losses hard, we hardly recover uh, because these are actually basically the entropy losses and also the Boltzmann losses are uh, mostly related to emission angle of the, the, um, the black body radiation. So basically, um, uh, but there is a huge contribution to the losses from most of the thermalization losses, as you see here. So this is the power output from the uh, for, from the semiconductors that we can get out. Um, but actually, we, we lost a lot of things with the thermalization. Uh, tandem cells are good then uh, because we can minimize this thermalization losses uh, by utilizing the spectrum more effectively. But for sure, for this, we have to use, a, um, I mean, we have to couple uh, the good semiconductor with another good semiconductor. And this is a, a very popular graph, uh, frequently updated by Amolf. And actually it's showing the uh, detailed balance limit and thermodynamic limit of the, uh, any semiconductor can reach. And as you see here, the ideal band cap is around here. Um, and the, uh, the dominant technology crystalline silicon is located here. It's very nice and good technology. And ideally, if you make a tandem cell, you, you need to choose a semiconductor within this blue band. This is the 75% of the details balance limit. So basically, um, and we have some few options, gallium arsenide, gallium indium phosphate. They are already um, well-known tandem technologies here. The perovskite is quite promising. I think uh, majority of the, the uh, audience of this 
talk knows why the perovskites are uh, really high quality semiconductors. Um, and as I said, we have to use the uh, spectral more effectively. And if you use uh, only the crystalline silicon, we are able to utilize this portion of the, the solar spectrum, the orange line, uh, the shaded area is the solar spectrum uh, intensity. And if you put another uh, white band gap material on top of the crystalline silicon, we can, as you see here, we can utilize the spectrum more effectively. For sure, this should be a uh, high absorption coefficient material, and then uh, we can really minimize the losses here. And also, it should be very high quality semiconductor. Uh, for sure, we are not limited by two junction, and you can extend and uh, stretch this to the whole spectrum, and you can do multi junction devices, either triple, quadruple, and beyond. Uh, all these things are possible. Um, but at the moment, we are talking about two junction tandem cells. Um, and tandem concept is not something new. And uh, I think uh, if you look at here uh, from 1985, all these uh, purple lines are showing the, the multi junction cells. And as you see that, uh, they are really located on top of the NREL chart. Uh, this is the best efficiency research cell efficiency chart, frequently updated by NREL in US. And obviously, you see that even for the non concentrated cells, the cells are already super efficient. Uh, so the question why we haven't utilized them so far on a gigawatt scale if they are so efficient, well, the answer is quite clear and simple. And making them um, high efficiency um, is not the only criteria, it's not sufficient. So we have to make them also cost effective and we have to be able to fabricate them with a scalable method and this should be a reliable technology if you want to reach such uh such a high level so for these perovskites and silicon they are a good couple definitely um we can tune the band gap of the perovskite to maximize the, the light coupling um and uh, also uh, uh we can do them in a in the multiple configurations basically here you see um we can fabricate two terminal three terminal or four terminal tandem cells and they can be in the uh, the monolithic form they can be in the mechanically stacking form um and we have a lot of module configurations but i have again i will reiterate um uh, the expression again i mean so far we don't have any gigawatt scale tandem technology so far that we utilize and uh, uh, most of the, the tandem technologies uh, basically used for um, uh, concentrated photovoltaics or space photovoltaics, and uh, the cost was not a primary factor over there. But here we have to make them really large area and uh, uh, large volume manufacturing. Um, well, and how these perovskite silicon tandem solar cells look like, and basically we have a quite um, a thick silicon wafer, and I'm saying thick because compared to the perovskite, it's pretty much thick. Uh, today, the industrial wafers, usually the, uh, their thickness is around 150 and 180 micrometers. And uh, uh, for the academic works, uh, people mostly use the 250 microns. And uh, well, the total thickness of the, the perovskite layer is basically less than two micron. And imagine that um, we are just depositing a kind of nano layers on top of the uh, the uh, crystalline silicon wafers and we are forming the tandem cell here crystalline silicon cells are absorbing the near infrared light as you see here and also the perovskite portion is mostly absorbing the blue spectrum as i also showed on the um the solar spectrum a few slides before um all right um well actually i'll talk about a little bit uh what kind of progress we have made so far on the optical design of these devices uh, because the light coupling is uh, quite important to make efficient on themselves um, and uh, for sure uh, i mean this uh, the light coupling is highly dictated by so by also um, the bottom cell um, uh, choice and uh, there are three um, mainstream crystalline silicon technologies uh, at the moment in the market and the most dominant one is the perk and the perk as you see that the typical process involves the front contact is textured, rear side is planar, and um, and usually there is a, uh, I mean, the, the nitride layer, insulating layer, and there is a um, the silver contacts that diffuse through by the local openings, and they also diffuse through these, uh, the front contacts. Well, I mean, the perk cells are a bit tricky to make a tandem cell, 
because usually we don't have a direct access to recombination junction here. In top cone, this is a bit more flexible that we can do indeed uh, high temperature processing cells. And the rear side is pretty similar uh, to PERC, uh, but in the front side, we can also accommodate indium tin oxide or any, any, any other kind of uh, TCO. Uh, if we, I mean, if we remove this, uh, how to say, um, uh, the nitride layer, it is possible to make a, um, uh, the recombination junction on the top cone cells. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the right hand side, uh, silicon heterojunction junction is also quite promising. And then we can do double side texturing uh, with this configuration. Uh, basically, we have a symmetrical passive weighting contacts in the front side. Uh, we have directly transparent conductive oxide. We don't need to uh, fire through this uh, front electrodes, so we can use also the front TCO directly as a recombination layer. That's why uh, recently, uh, majority of the works in the perovskite silicon tandem field is coming from the silicon heterojunction. Um, and the, um, so basically, we are getting a better um, spectral response, minimize the reflections, and also easy to fabricate. Um, and texturing is important um, and is not something new. Uh, if you look at this, um, graph actually it's explaining nice nicely it's a uh, it's from an article from 1987 uh, so basically it's not uh, something new uh, well actually the silicon is basically it's a indirect band gap semiconductor its absorption coefficient is pretty low uh, and compared to direct semiconductors for sure um, and in this case we need to help silicon to absorb the light more and we want that the light is bouncing more inside the silicon so that's why we put a texturing in the front and rear side basically this is not a very complicated thing uh, but it's a very smart way to do that uh, we just slice the wafers uh, by aiming that the planar side is one zero zero plane because these are single crystal and when we etch away then we form this kind of uh, pyramidal shapes uh, in the front surface and uh, by tuning the size and um, and the base distribution, we can really minimize the reflection um, on the, the silicon cells. And as you see here, um, uh, if we make a double side texturing, we can really um, approach to the Lambertian limits. And th that's very good. Um, and this is also standard thing in the industry. But the problem is now here. Uh, if you want to fabricate the perovskite on such layers, the problem is that you have to make um, a good uh, coverage on these pyramids. You shouldn't have any open uh, the pyramids uh, because basically they will be touching your front tissue and it will be causing a shunt. So uh, vacuum techniques are pretty good for this. Uh, and uh, But actually so far the vacuum based techniques are not as efficient as the, uh, the solution based techniques. Uh, but so solution based techniques, spin coating, slow dye coating, uh, we have to really levelize the, uh, the perovskite to make sure that um, and it, not, not, none of these pyramids are coming out. And this was also the case when we tried, uh, when we attempted first time to spin code the perovskite on top of the commercial grade um, crystalline silicon wafers. And the, the, the very first thing that we found was the pyramids were, were actually coming out. And uh, basically, the, the, this device is uh, by default shunted. So um, we overcame this issue uh, by following a, um, a few steps strategy. Uh, first, actually, we studied um, to reduce to the pyramid size, um, and uh, because typically the pyramid size in the, the market uh, was around, you know, around the five micron, six micron level, uh, and the, the idea was reducing the pyramid size, still enabling a continuous um, distribution, homogeneous distribution on the, the crystalline silicon surface, and still the um, uh, minimize the reflection with a meaningful pyramid size. Uh, and for this, uh, we did several optimizations by the, the etching process. Um, and uh, we found that actually the two micrometer and less uh, is the ideal thickness uh, is the uh, for the, the perovskite silicon tongue themselves. Uh, if you use a spin coating method, the next challenge was making it a bit thick. So basically, we use a bit more concentrated precursor solutions and optimize the process further. And indeed, actually, this strategy worked. As you see on the right hand side, um, we really minimize the reflections, especially for in the near infrared region. Uh, so basically, this strategy worked well, and uh, we minimize the reflections on the uh, the pyramidally textured um, uh, bottom cells. 
Uh, well, I mean, for sure, if you deposit the conformal layer, you can get uh, the similar effect uh, even better. Uh, but our method enabled to uh, make a solution process perovskites on textured interfaces. So uh, after that, yeah, I mean, okay, we have a good perovskite, uh, but we also did some uh, optimization um, on the context because uh, for the, uh, the we have a lot of losses because we have a lot of uh, layers are stacked in the tandem cell. Usually, more than 15 layers are stacked. Um, and in this case, uh, the the smart thing is that um, uh, playing with the optics uh, and minimizing the the parasitic losses. And for this, um, we used um, a different strategy than the literature. Actually, this is not something new. Again, um, it's a well-known thing in the literature, but we just adopted it for our tandem cells uh, in a proper way. Um, and basically, uh, for these devices, you have to displace the rear contact, the metal contact, um, to get, I mean, to approach the ideal mirror conditions. You don't want, uh, you don't want too much plasmonic absorptions at the metal semiconductor interface. And uh, uh, but for sure, um, the typical thing have been used so far was a thick TCO, and usually the thickness is around 120 nanometers, and the TCO is basically absorbing light a lot. In this case, what we did, uh, we thinned down the TCO at the rear side and we put a, a low, refractive, low refractive index material, uh, magnesium fluoride. You can also put something else between the, the silver and the ICO contacts. And we actually uh, approached the ideal mirror condition. By doing this, actually, we enhanced the current density a lot um, because we minimized the, uh, the parasitic absorption losses at the rear contact of the, the tandem cells. Uh, we did a similar strategy at the front side because the light is coming in the, uh, from the front side. Definitely any parasitic losses um, will cost us uh, the current losses. So basically uh, here, uh, one of the biggest contribution was coming from the front TCO. And we did the thickness optimization uh, by doing a power loss analysis. And then actually we found that if you use a 40 nanometers, uh, we are uh, matching the current density at the subcells nicely and also we minimize the absorption losses uh, especially for in the deep blue part well um, the other um, contribution is also from uh, for sure from the front contacts uh, because if you make a if you use a resistive uh, tco then you have to put more fingers for efficient charge collection uh, in this case and we had to optimize also the number of the fingers and their distribution uh, and uh, in this case, we maximized also the power conversion efficiency uh, by just tuning the uh, the, the fingers. Um, and overall, a quick summary here. Uh, and what we what we get out from these um, optimizations? Uh, well, if you look at this graph here, and especially for the rear ISO side, we had a huge reduction from the, the current losses, and as, and also the front TCO that we had a a uh, huge reduction and even at the recombination junction we had a huge re uh, reduction i'll come that point because we, in this work we also uh thin down the uh, the recombination junction further and i'll speak a little bit about also more uh contact and interface engineering um the very first thing that we did uh, some time ago it was in 20 uh 2022 uh, again with my colleague jian lu uh, and actually uh, we we look the the perovskite um, uh, C60 interface and uh, because um, the overall idea was really minimizing the voltage losses as much as possible. Uh, so one thing that we did um, we tried to figure out why there is a, a voltage losses even if you bring the energy level alignment uh, uh, of the, the perovskite and fuller and as close as possible. Uh, and actually, we was we were working with the uh, uh, with the calculation team, and then we understood actually uh, if we approach to the fuller and layers towards the surface of the, the perovskite, uh, we start to form a kind of uh, defect states within the band cap. But not that this is not a, a defect state from the the fuller in itself. Uh, these are uh, actually induced defects, uh, which means that it's like. Uh, very well known thing in the uh, the silicon uh, research as well is uh, metal induced gap states um, and the, basically 
that the wave functions of the, the perovskite and C60 are overlapping and it's behaving like a defect. So the only way to do that, um, displacing the contact between perovskite and fuller, and then and this is done in the past by lithium fluoride, but this is not a viable option for the long term because uh, lithium fluoride is, is is a bit tricky. It's lithium is diffusing the perovskite and other contacts, and in the end um, we lost this layer, and plus it, it's causing also performance losses. So. Uh, you can use any other uh, metal oxide as, as well, not necessarily uh, magnesium fluoride, but in this example, we found magnesium fluoride works very nicely. Uh, and actually it is really displacing the contact uh, and we are not forming a continuous layer probably. Uh, it's ultra thin layer is around one nanometer. And then the, uh, the, uh, this is allowing the tunneling of the charge at the contact. So in doing so, we minimize the, the voltage losses uh, and we increase the quasi family level splitting from the, the perovskite subcell. And overall, in this work at that time, we reached 29.3% efficiency. Um, but for sure, we didn't stop there and we continue looking for the other contacts. And this time, the uh, whole selective contact. Uh, in 2020, when we introduced first time this uh, double side texture tandems with solution processing, we were using a nickel oxide. Then later on, we passivated nickel oxide uh, because we found that there is a redox reactions are happening at the nickel oxide perovskite interface. Uh, but still, we had the voltage losses. And then actually, we also tried to adopt one of the best uh, polymeric uh, whole transport layer in literature. It's a PTAA. And we tried to adopt it, but we never reached a level that a conformal coverage uh, with this method although the sputtering was quite nicely. Uh, but later on in 2020, actually, the, the team of uh, HZP and Kaunas, they introduced the surface and monolayers on tandem cells. Indeed, it was an interesting thing for us as well, because it was a, we were able to form a conformal coverage on the, the textured interfaces. Uh, basically, it's a self-limiting reaction. And, and in the end, um, what we get out from the, uh, the, the cells it was quite good. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, in this work, um, we focused on also uh, the recombination junction. This is the, another important junction uh, on the another important layer in the uh, perovskite silicon tandem cells. So, what we have done, um, and typically in the past we were using indium tin oxide at the recombination junction, uh, but we understood actually. Uh, the surface potential at the, the TCOs are different because, uh, especially for you see the extreme case here for indium zirconium oxide, and this is forming a large uh, crystal, crystallites. Basically, these are polycrystalline materials, ITO and ISRO. And this, uh, the polycrystalline materials, uh, th th there are different grains and they have different grain orientations on the surface. And we understood that actually they already have a different potential distributions. And plus, if you anchor your SAMs on these surfaces, they also bring, uh, they also follow, uh, mimic this this trend. Uh, and in this case, uh, our strategy was using actually the amorphous layer. And then we said, why we don't use indium zinc oxide because there is no crystal here. And uh, we found that really the the surface potential is uh, start to be more homogeneous when we start using I zero, and even the after anchoring the the surface and monolayer on top of the I zero. So basically. At the recombination junction, we had a chance to minimize the um, the inhomogeneities, and by doing so, we also uh, achieved a better coverage of the SAMs, and this also reflected the work function shifts, and basically um, this enabled us more homogeneous coverage of the the SAMs on the uh, at the recombination junction. And another thing also we did in this work, uh, we reduced the thickness of the uh, the recombination junctions as low as possible. The idea was um, uh, making a kind of more resistive recombination junctions and also um, exploring uh, the, the, the influence of the thickness because we never ask this question to ourselves why we use a thick ISO layers, why we don't use a thinner one because we want to minimize the TCO as much as possible due to the optical reasons. Then later on we found actually uh, in this work, five nanometers is working nicely uh, and magically uh, for our cells, but for the other uh, the research groups, maybe the thickness range may vary between the five to 10 nanometers, but in our case, five nanometer was the ideal one. And we had a chance to enhance the electric field because of the enhanced um, 
the same coverage and also a better homogeneity at the interfaces. So basically, this device uh, end up with, uh, I mean, adding all these improvements with 32.5% certified efficiency. And uh, basically, um, and if uh, this device also had a potential to reach the efficiency level around 34.7%, uh, these are actually calculated values uh, from the uh, PL and EL measurements. We constructed the JV curve, and uh, this JV curve is showing uh, the potential of the cell if the series resistance uh, at the contacts can be eliminated. So transport losses are eliminated. Um, well, I mean, very recently, um, uh, this is uh, uh, ongoing work. Um, and actually, uh, rather than the contacts, we also focus on the, the bulk of the perovskite. And so here, what we have done, uh, instead of using the typical um, metal ammonium, formamidium, cesium, SR cations, um, we start to use high PKA um, cation at the inter at the uh, the bulk. Uh, we use this cation as additive. I'm not able to express the name at the moment because this is under submission. Uh, but basically, this enabled us to, uh, the better passivation, uh, defect passivation in the bulk uh, because of the, the nature of the molecule is a cyclic structure. Uh, and it has a three NH groups, and uh, uh, and actually these NH groups are forming a um, uh, the hydrogen bonds uh, with the iodide at the multiple directions, and it's actually uh, well anchored to the cage, and uh, it's quite favorable thing, and also it's helping for the enhanced stability. For instance, you see here the PL peak position from the uh, the perovskite layer after 30 minutes, keeping it at one sun and 85 C. So basically, it's also helping for the phase stability. So this device is actually. Uh, Last year in May, almost uh, one year ago, it led uh, actually uh, another record efficiency with 33.7%. Um, and actually with this device, um, for sure, again, we repeated the same uh, measurement and we found actually these devices have potential close to 36%. But in the long term, definitely uh, we predict these perovskite silicon tandem cells can go uh, above 37%. That is pretty much uh, possible if we can really further minimize the losses. I will uh, finish my talk, but actually just one minute, maybe I'll take about uh, talking about the stability uh, because uh, last year together with my colleague Tom Allen, uh, we uh, organized a, a panel discussion at Tandem View Workshop. Uh, and it was a quite fruitful discussion and actually, um, and we had the panelists from academia and industry but the main message of this panel was actually we need more efforts on the, the for the stability aspects and uh, and the stability, durability, and reliability aspects. So basically, uh, this is the thing. Actually, probably the community will be more occupied uh, in the the uh, next period, uh, and is also uh, quite important because um, and if you look at the situation back in 1980s when the uh, the silicon cells entered the market. Basically, there was no competition. The, the PV module prices were quite high, and uh, there was almost no uh, warranty actually. And uh, but within the years, uh, by building a trust on the products, recently many, uh, many, many companies are offering uh, st um, uh, the module warranties uh, above 25 years. Some of them are above 30 years, and this trend will be increasing further. Uh, I mean. Probably very soon, the, the third tiers will be NIF standard. And for sure, in the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that the module costs are pretty low. So basically, the tandems also should be fitting in that range. And we cannot put tandems here again. Uh, it must be cost efficient. So there is a huge market barrier for perovskite silicon tandems. We have to make it super efficient, super cheap, and super stable. So without working stability, it's difficult to realize. Um, Perovskite silicon tandems. Well, this slide is a bit busy. All right. Yeah. Thank you for listening. I'll be uh, happy to get questions if there is nothing further. Yeah. Thank you. Nothing further. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Erkan. This was amazing. I learned a lot of things. There are several questions in the chat. Uh, please start replying to that and we will check them later. Now is uh, time for URSA. We learn more about the fabrication of perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. URSA is going to show you how to optimize uh, uh, these uh, devices via simulation. 
Ursa is a senior scientist here at Fraxim. He received his PhD from the ETH Zurich, and now he was working on quantum well, uh, quantum well solar cells. Since uh, joining Fraxim in 2018, he's also a guest lecturer at the ETH, and here he's going to present an analysis and optimization of perovskite silicon tandem solar cells by full optoelectronic simulation. Thanks, Urs. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniele, for the kind introduction. Yes, so my uh, presentation is more about the modeling, uh, what we can learn um, about these devices by using simulation. So one of the motivations for this kind of work is the obvious question that many researchers uh, in PV have, namely how good is the solar cell that I fabricated? Of course, one way is just to look at uh, the best cells. Oh, you have seen this chart uh, in the talk before. Uh, but this is basically just a relative assessment. So you see, compared to others, how good it is, usually maybe not so good. But uh, then the question is, how much better could it be uh, than what it actually is? And, and this is, is the question also about the, the limits of the efficiency. So you have um, heard about that a bit uh, in the previous talk. I'm going to uh, go into a bit more details. We have also seen this, this graph here, which is basically the the reference um, limit, uh, the so-called single junction detailed balance limit, also, also called chocolate quasi limit, where the efficiency is just a function of one single material parameter, namely the energy band gap. So what are the assumptions behind this, this limit? Um, well, the first one is that you have a very idealized absorption, so basically a unit state absorptance uh, given by the band gap uh, value. So this then provides basically the short circuit current upon integration of the solar spectrum with this uh, unit stepped absorbance. Then the photons, they are um, they generate electron hole pairs uh, with unit uh, generation efficiency, and these electron hole pairs they are thermalized with the lattice. So there's only one temperature, which is the one of, of the lattice. And this is also the ambient uh, temperature. Then the transport is also idealized, so we assume that the carriers uh, can be extracted uh, with unit uh, efficiency due to infinite mobility, and this also leads to flat quasi Fermi levels or uniform splitting of the quasi Fermi uh, levels uh, given by the external voltage. Then also the contacts are assumed to be perfect, so they're perfectly selective and there are no resistive losses. Recombination is limited to the radiative process or so the fundamental process. And this then gives you the second current that you need, namely the recombination current, now as a function of the black body uh, flux. Um, and uh, here the chemical potential of the photons that are emitted uh, is given by the external voltage. Then finally, the, the light that is emitted uh, is assumed to be emitted into a hemisphere. So this is uh, gives rise to this Boltzmann loss that uh, Erkan mentioned before. So um, this, these are some assumptions that lead to this efficiency, uh, but then the question is, why is it so low? Huh? And this is also something that Erkan mentioned. There are some uh, some losses that are implied in these assumptions. So, and these are uh, basically the transmission and thermalization losses um, of, of photons that are not absorbed or high energy photons were part of the, or this excess energy goes into heat. And this is exactly uh, where the, the um, multi-junction or tandem concepts um, starts uh, trying to reduce these losses. But also here, the question is, what is then the limit in this uh, tandem concept? Well, to get to this limit, um, basically we have to uh, relax the unit step uh, absorption. So we have now a, a slightly different uh, absorption profile with um, two steps. Well, the bottom uh, cell gets just the energy in this window up to the higher band gap, and then you have the unit step absorption of the the top cell that has a higher band gap. Then also, uh, we if we look at two terminal tandems, um, we have the condition of current matching. So the two uh, currents need to be the same. Additionally, we assume that the 
there is no voltage loss at the interconnect. So we have an ideal series connection and we don't lose any voltage. So the external voltage is the sum of the two uh, subcell voltages. And then we can uh, express again uh, the two uh, subcell currents in the same way as before, just now with the new um, absorption profile. If we do that for a pair of skies with a band gap of uh, 1.65 electron volts and the standard silicon band gap, we uh, find well that the tandem is quite severely uh, bottom limited. So it's the, the silicon that uh, limits the conserved current here. And also this configuration, well, it is not in the sweet spot of the detailed balance limit, but it gives around 40%. However, we have seen that uh, currently the record efficiencies are rather in the uh, range of 34%. So there is some discrepancy and this of course uh, comes from losses that are not accounted for uh, by the detailed bands limit due to this idealization of the um, properties. So we need a more realistic assessment uh, to get closer to what we actually have. So we need to increase the degree of non-ideality in, in our model. And the first uh, step towards a more realistic assessment is to relax the uh, unit step absorptance um, condition. So we we now work with the actual spectral absorptance of, of our materials that we get from an optical model. And uh, the main ingredient for this optical model for the absorptance is the layout of the stack. So you can see here uh, quite a complex sequence of, of layers. Uh, and the second um, input uh, or material uh, parameter we need uh, is the complex refractive index data. So you can see here the uh, N and K values for the uh, white band gap perovskite. So this is um, for a standard uh, triple codine uh, mixed halide perovskite um, from EPFL and then the silicon um, refractive index data. So we now uh, compute the short circuit current and the um, radiative dark current based on this, uh, the absorptions um, that we get from this data. So now the optical model, um, how, how uh, it is um, chosen depends on uh, whether you have thin film layers or incoherent thick um, bulk components. So for the thin films, and you have a lot of thin films in your stack, including the perovskite, uh, the standard uh, model is uh, transfer matrix method, where you uh, propagate the complex amplitudes of plane waves through uh, a stack using the Fresnel coefficients uh, at the interfaces between materials with different refractive indices. If you have, uh, like we do in this case, also uh, incoherent thick layers where um, the light loses coherence, um, so you have some um, part that is much larger than the wavelength of the light, um, what we use here is a kind of ray optics model uh, that is based on the balance of the fluxes uh, incident on different parts of the device. So if you have an interface, you have to make the uh, the balance of incident uh, and and outgoing uh, fluxes. So now we have uh, the combination of these two uh, models for the propagation of incident uh, light uh, through our device to compute the absorptance in the active layers. And you see here that now this really deviates from the well unit step absorptance even though it's actually quite close to one uh, in a significant part of, of the spectrum that is absorbed. What you can also see is that the short circuit current that you um, compute based on, on that uh, is not well matched. So even in this uh, situation where the, you have a finite thickness of, of the, the top cell uh, that allows some part of the light uh, in the um, higher energy uh, domain to be absorbed in the bottom, we have a bottom limitation. Now we can use this absorptance to compute actually the uh, 
uh, current voltage characteristics and and then the um, uh, power conversion efficiency uh, at this optical limit uh, as I, I call it. Uh, this deviates from the shock liquidizer detailed balance limit due to the different uh, absorptance. So first of all, the top cell uh, short circuit current is, is um, reduced, but also um, um, the one from, from the um, silicon to the uh, finite absorptance here. So you have a, a slightly lower uh, um, PC, but also you have this problem with the bottom limitation. So you want to increase the photo current in the bottom cell. So this is the first thing you, you should do. And uh, in order to see how one can do that, uh, we need to look at the optical losses. Um, so we compute uh, the absorptance in the different parts of the device. And uh, we see directly that parasitic absorption in non-active layers affect primarily the top cell absorptance and not the bottom cell. So it's not really um, useful to do a lot of work at this point um, to increase the current in the, the bottom. Um, however, we have to not only look at the absorptance, but uh, most importantly at the photo current that is produced. And we see also that this um, parasitic absorptance is in a region where there's actually not too much uh, photon flux. So another representation is then more useful that directly translates into uh, the spectral uh, current density. Uh, and so we can actually quantify the different uh, currents um, uh, the, the one that is absorbed in the active layers and the, then the parasitic uh, losses due to uh, absorption in the non-active layers and also the significant reflection loss that we still have here in the region of the bottom cell. So what we can see is that there is a domain where there is an overlap in uh, absorptance and this can be used to redistribute the absorption um, from the top to the bottom cell to mitigate this mismatch in the, the current. And uh, of course, what you have to do is to reduce the um, perovskite thickness, which increases the silicon uh, photocurrent um, until you reach a current matching condition. So you can see how here in this overlap region, the contribution of the bottom cell increases while the top cell contribution decreases. If we do that, we find the match situation. However, um, the current is still quite low, so we increased the efficiency a little, but it's still uh, not ideal. So therefore, we we now look at this part where we have significant loss due to reflection, and we have seen in the previous talk also that uh, one way of uh, reducing these losses is to uh, increase the um, light path uh, length in the silicon via um, scattering at the texture. So first we consider a situation where we have just one interface that is textured, which is the rear interface here. So the incident light scatters into larger angle and the light path in the silicon then is increased. We model this um, in our uh, software, which is called ZFOS, using a uh, validated um, multi-scale approach. So first you compute the properties of the thin film uh, part, the coherent stack, as we call it. Uh, in this case, it's the it's coherent stack here on the, the rear side on top of this um, texture. And this then is used in a ray tracer to compute the scattering properties uh, of the complex interface. And this again is used in the uh, well, transfer matrix type uh, retardation model as before. So you have then just um, the propagation again in the entire stack, but including the scattering at the interface. If we do that, uh, including this scattering texture, we see that indeed we can gain a lot of uh, additional current here in the long wavelength region. There's also a small decrease, um, but this is again the situation where we find the optimum thickness um, for uh, current matching. 
So now we are actually quite close to the shock required limit. Um, that well, how it is on 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 this um, uh, idealized absorption. But this is not the end of the story because you could also have a double side texture. Um, and in this case, we assume not a planarized perovskite, but this um, conformal coating that I can also mention. This gives you an additional uh, current, not only in the bottom cell, but also in the top cell. So again, this is the situation that is already optimized with regards to current matching. And since we have now a uh, larger um, absorption in the silicon, also the optimum thickness uh, of the top cell of the perovskite uh, shifts to a larger value. So we have we had uh, for the uh, flat um, case, we had 380 nanometers. For the fully textured, we have uh, 530 uh, nanometers. Again, we can have a look now at uh, the situation regarding the losses, and we see that uh, the, indeed the reflection loss is strongly reduced. But as Erkan also mentioned, there is now room for improvement regarding the parasitic absorption, especially at the rear side, for instance, in the silver. Now <laughs> we find that we actually exceed now the detailed balance uh, limit. So maybe this is not such a good limit after all, because the uh, assumption of this unrealistic uh, absorption seems to be non-ideal for uh, the tandem configuration. And this is actually the maximum efficiency that you can uh, achieve with this NK data if you only change the perovskite thickness. So this was the optical situation, and we have now these optical limits but if you compare it with the measured performance for this uh, rear textured cell, there is, of course, still a big gap. So the question is, how can we get from this optical limit to the measured um, performance? And of course, the answer is that uh, we need to relax not only the optical idealizations or assumptions of the detail balance limit, but also the electrical assumptions. So there will be transport non-idealities like low carrier mobilities or potential barriers or even some fields that prevent efficient carrier extraction. Then also there are non-rated different combination losses in the bulk and the interfaces. Um, there's also OSHA recombination and then contacts can be non-ideal regarding the alignment uh, of the um, the energy levels or the selectivity. There may, might be some leakage even. And to accommodate such uh, non-idealities, we have to uh, combine the optical simulation with an electrical model. The standard electrical model for solar cells uh, is based on the charge continuity equations, uh, including a generation and recombination term with currents that are described by brief diffusion terms for electrons and holes, and this is coupled to the Poisson equation for the electrostatic potential. Now, in the case of perovskite, we also need to include uh, mobile ions in the drift diffusion Poisson framework. And in perovskite, we also have the situation that we have a highly uh, emissive system, or let's say we are often relatively close to the radiative limit. Uh, and in this situation, reabsorption effect and photon recycling can also start to play a role. Now for two, ta two terminal tandems, as we are considering here, we, of course, also need a model for the series interconnection of the subcells, uh, uh, meaning the, the recombination junction. So this is how we uh, implement uh, the full tandem structure electrically. So there is a range of additional material parameters that need to be included now, in addition to just NK data and the layer thicknesses. Most importantly, the energy level levels of the material, so the, the band um, edge energies for conduction and valence bands or homolumo, depending on whether you uh, talk about inorganic or organic materials. But of course, there are also more uh, parameters like mobilities, uh, lifetimes, and so on. Now, uh, 
we have here uh, the uh, perovskite tops and a silicon uh, heterochunk bottom cell integrated in the full tandem and they are connected here via the recombination junction and the, this is the place where you have the um, uh, recombination of, of electrons uh, and, and holes from the subcells that enable the flow of uh, charge across the entire uh, cell. So how does this look like? Uh, for instance, at short circuit conditions, you can see here uh, the component currents of electrons and holes that uh, increase within the absorbing region. So you have the effect of generation here, and then you have the uh, recombination of the generated carriers uh, at the recombination junction. And overall, the total current uh, is conserved um, over the entire uh, device. Now we start with uh, looking at the situation of the single junction configuration subcells and the filtered subcells in the tandem configuration. Now this uh, allows you to assess uh, the losses that come from the optical situation. Uh, so we have a slightly um, reduced uh, conserved current here, um, which is still uh, limited by the uh, the bottom cell. So the optics did not change, of course. Um, and we can now um, uh, compare uh, also the electrical situation in, let's say, isolated condition compared with what happens inside uh, the, the tandem. And then we can compare these subcell characteristics with uh, the full tandem characteristic. For instance, by uh, just adding uh, the subcell or the filtered subcell JV curves, in this case, we see that uh, it's a perfect uh, match. So there are actually no losses uh, that incur from uh, connecting the device into series. So it's quite an ideal situation. Um, well, this is at the OSHA limit. No? So this is, is as good as it gets, uh, including transport. What does it mean? Well, as I said, the optics is already the one that uh, we looked at before. So we have about the same current, but the uh, electrical situation is still idealized. So we have a higher VOC, a higher fill factor, and overall a larger um, efficiency. Now, having the full simulation uh, electrically allows us to inspect the situation regarding uh, the transport properties at the operating point of the device. So, for instance, the maximum power point, we can inspect the quasar Fermi level splitting, uh, potential gradients we find in the quasar Fermi levels, or also the alignment at the recombination junction to see whether there is an issue um, with uh, voltage losses due to uh, non idealities already at this um, level. Now, of course, we want also to uh, inspect the impact of defects. This is actually for a different uh, device, so it's a slightly different current. And here I uh, increase the density of defects in uh, interface uh, regions of the uh, perovskite top cell, which of course then leads to a drop in the um, open circuit voltage and also fill factor. What is interesting is that you can actually propagate now this loss from the single junction uh, perovskite situation to what you have in the tandem. And you see that actually the impact on the tandem level is, is more uh, dramatic. Also, you can see that uh, the situation um, changes regarding the optimal thickness when you include uh, defects in the picture. So a uh, more defective device here requires a larger perovskite layer thickness for an optimum performance. Now you can combine all these different levels of idealization into the full loss analysis. So this is quite a, a crude um, a picture. Uh, uh, on on this uh, at this point, so starting from the optical limit, you go uh, where you have idealized uh, transport, but re but realistic optics, to a limit where you have uh, realistic transport, but uh, only well Auger recombination, say, and radiative in the perovskite, 
to uh, the situation where you have also the uh, non-rated different combination losses, defects at interfaces, and so on. Now you can refine this picture according to your needs because you can just switch on and off different loss channels in your uh, transport model. So you can split uh, this into different contributions to, to different interfaces, uh, different um, material um, contributions to bulk uh, recombination and so on. Um, also, you can uh, have a look at the impact of photon recycling, luminescent coupling, uh, which is actually something that uh, my student Simon Seder presented already. Um, so what do I mean by photon recycling and luminescent coupling? Well, basically photon recycling is the reabsorption of light emitted within the same layer, while uh, luminescent coupling is a reabsorption of light emitted by the perovskite in the silicon uh, bottom cell. So it's additional current that comes actually from the perovskite emission. Well, we can we developed a formalism that allows us to uh, actually compute uh, with spectral and spatial resolution um, where we have this additional generation in our device, both for photon recycling and luminescent coupling. And we can couple this to the full transport picture. This allows us to quantify the impacts of, of photon recycling, luminescent coupling, not only at the radiative limit, but also in the presence of uh, recombination at, at defects, so including, for instance, shocker read halt. And we can not only uh, uh, have a look at, at photocurrents, but also at the, the actual efficiency gain that you can have from photon recycling and luminescent coupling. So finally, um, this simulation uh, approach is not confined to steady state properties, but we can also inspect transients. So then you solve the drift diffusion uh, equations in, in time uh, domain or with time uh, dependence. And this is something that can be used to have a look at things like hysteresis. Uh, now here, uh, this is actually by my colleague, uh, colleague Davide Moya. Um, he looked at different uh, situations for this perovskite silicon tandem. First, the situation where the silicon cell is limiting. And in this uh, situation, uh, one finds that the potential across the perovskite cell is approximately constant um, for all the different points of operation. And this also means if you compute the, uh, well, the, the, the transient uh, scan, voltage scan, there is ne negligible hysteresis. On the other hand, if the perovskite cell is limiting, if you change the point of operation, there is actually also a change of the voltage across the perovskite. So it changes with the applied voltage, and this leads to quite pronounced hysteresis. So uh, the bottom line is that uh, the limiting subcell determines uh, the hysteresis behavior that you observe. Okay, so in, in conclusion, um, I, I try to show that if you want to do a device specific performance assessment and also optimization, you need to consider the optics of the device. So you should use something like an optical limit rather than the standard detailed balance limit. Uh, we performed the optical loss analysis and optimization on flat and textured perovskite silicon tandems based on this multi scale optical model. And I also showed how uh, optical electronic device simulation, if you explicitly consider the recombination junction, enables the assessment of electrical losses, uh, not only um, at the ESC or short circuit, but at the actual point of operation of, of your device. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues in the R&D team and also uh, in the set for software development team for um, providing me with this uh, nice tool and also the colleagues from uh, PV Lab in Neuchâtel that provided the um, NK data and some experimental results and also the Swiss National Science Foundation for funding in the framework of the radicals project. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot Urs. It was a great understanding of our perovskite silicon tandem solar cells work. Um, there are a lot of questions, but we are running late in, ta uh, late in time. Uh, let me check uh, quickly. Urs, 
can you use Cephos to simulate also for the terminal tandem solar cells? Yes, well, four terminal tandems uh, are not that, uh, let's say, involved. Uh, what what uh, regards the, the requirements on the uh, electrical simulation because you don't have this recombination junction uh, in between. The optics basically is the same, uh, but then you just do the individual simulations under the condition of voltage matching. Uh, but the, the individual simulation of the of the subcells you can do uh, separately. Yes, using Zephos is no problem. And one question for you, Erkan. Um, is there a particular reason for using two PACZ over NE for PACZ in your solar cells? No. Uh, well, I mean, um, basically, two PACZ is working nicely uh, because it's. Uh, the perovskite formation on two packs is um, usually much better, uh, but actually we also use me for Paxi, uh, but in this case we have to do treatment under the surface. Actually, this is well explained by the also the HLB team, um, and they showed uh, the the wettability problems on me for Paxi, and this problem is still valid on the textured interfaces. Uh, but that specific work in the, the work that published in Nature, we used 2PAXI, but in the recent works, we also start to explore me 4 paxi um, And it's correct. I mean, me 4 paxi is giving a bit better voltage uh, around, uh, I have to say, maybe 10 to 20 millivolt higher voltage. Uh, but actually, time by time, it comes with the cost of lower field factor of the devices because of uh, the coverage problems, and it must be well engineered. Right. Thanks a lot. There are a lot of questions. We have uh, no time left. Uh, uh, both presentation are going to be on YouTube uh, in a couple of days. Uh, we will see you in one month with a new webinar. And thanks a lot for watching this one. And uh, thanks, Erkan, again. Thanks, Ursa. And see you soon. Yeah. Thanks Bye. for the invitation. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.